Georgia Virtue presents the Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong podcast. Thank you for downloading episode 314. This week we have Bearing the Juice. No relief from inflation. Hush money. Let your freak flag fly as long as it's not the Stars and Stripes. Some dumb stuff from Texas. Don't speak in Rio. Kemp steps up against a thief. Taking aim at Burt Jones. And the cash pit called NPR. I'm Dave <laughs> Roberts. With me is Representative Emeritus, my partner's endeavor, Ken Pullen. Yeah, and it's Masters Week, which is a, one of the best golfing weeks of the year for us uh, golfers. And even I think my wife likes to watch golf also, or the Masters Week. Just for the azaleas? Just for the azaleas. Well, by the time this drops, it'll be tax day. <laughs> yes, I went ahead and filed mine. But yeah, it's tax day when it drops. That's cool. In a very yeah, a- sad way. <laughs> tax day should be the first Monday in November. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know when it should be. Uh, yeah, never. Well, I never. Guess. But yeah, the first Monday in November is right before the Tuesday following the first Monday in November, which is election day. Yeah, but they hell, should, most people don't pay taxes anymore anyway. So, you know, well, we'll get to that. 50, but yeah, but do, yeah, fifty percent of the public yeah. doesn't pay. Yeah, do away with withholding. Make everybody write a check. Yeah, I do agree with that. You should have to. Yep. If, if we're going to be taxed, you should have to write the check. Yeah, you should, you should feel the pain. You and should. then you might you might want to take aim at some of those social programs. Yeah, it would definitely change everybody's mindset on taxes. Yeah, a billion here, a trillion there. Uh, that Those numbers are so astronomical that people forget that it's actual money. So if you yep. actually had to write a check right before Election Day, things would actually change. Yeah, it would. Hey, and I know we didn't have this story in the, in the outline, but... This there's a state house race going on right now down in Columbus to replace uh, Chairman Richard Smith passed away you know late last year or actually earlier this year during session and they're having a special election to replace Richard Smith and there were four people that ran for it and I saw this reported on a Peach Pundit earlier from uh, one of my old friends or from one of my friends Scott Turner who used to be a representative but in the special election. And it's so intriguing. It was actually on April 9th was a special election. No candidate received 50 plus one. So there's a runoff. And I, I think both of us are not a big fan of runoffs. Uh, but two of the people, and this is uh, Carmen Rice and Sean Knox, and I know both of these people, they're in a special election runoff, which is scheduled May 7th. So if you follow me for just a minute, the primary election for this seat is actually May 21st. But they're in a special election which will be won or lost on May 7th. So if, for instance, Sean Knox could win on May 7th, and then the voters are going to vote two weeks later on that seat again, and Carmen Rice could win on May 21st. And that happens, Sean would serve to the end of the year, never actually go into the House chambers for a, a day because they don't come back into session until the first or second Monday in January, and then Carmen Rice will start serving. So... This is a very, it's just for us political people, but having a, and also just having a special election two weeks before the primary election, like how confused are voters going to be down in that district? Yeah. And and like we said, it's going to be during early voting. So early voting is going to be, I don't know, at the courthouse, whatever. But for the special election, you're going to have to go to your precinct. And they're two totally different ballots. Yeah, two totally different ballots. And look, you could vote, let's just say early voting starts on April 29th. If you go vote early on April 29th for the primary, you may just forget that you need to go back and vote on the special election a week later. 10 days later. Yeah. Yeah, 10 days later. So it's, uh, you know, we'll have to follow this and give an update. But, you know, I know they're hoping probably the same person wins both, but they were only separated by 12 votes in the first election. So this is truly... But, uh, you know, who gets their people out for the ground May game? 21st? Yeah, this is all ground game, and it's all ground game for May 21st. I mean, because you really don't necessarily care about the May 7th. Uh, it's ground game in the primary. Right? That's what they're really concentrating on. Yeah, so that's, was- just, that's just wild to me that the dates align like they did. Uh, I'm a big fan of ranked choice voting, ranked choice voting this 
probably wouldn't exist. And but anyway, we're, you know, it's not a that's not anything that's going to get passed anytime soon in Georgia. And it still wouldn't have mattered, <clears throat> other than this would be out of the way. Yeah, it would already be out of the way. That, yeah, it would be out of the way. But you're right. There'd I, still be all these people would still be running in the primary. Yep, totally. Yes, and that could end up wonderful. in a runoff very, very yeah. easily. Yeah, we're going to have to watch what happens in that. It's very intriguing. So we got the news Thursday that the juice is dead. O.J. Simpson has died of cancer at the age of 76, I think. Yeah, I didn't know he was sick. So he passed. He had, I guess, prostate cancer about a year ago. He was discovered, and that's what he ended up passing away from was cancer. Oh, he was lying on social media. He said, uh, "You know, I'm not, I'm not sick. I'm at a, I'm at a Super Bowl party and, and all this stuff." And he, in fact, is he was he was heading for hospice. You know, I'd forgotten. I had to look back at the dates because I remember when he was acquitted and went through that trial. I was in college, uh, so this would have been the mid '90s, I guess, early '90s, mid '95, '95. Yep. Yes, I was a sophomore in college, and I remember us all sitting around the dorm room watching what transpired in this trial because everybody was fixated on it, right? I mean, if the glove don't fit, acquit. I mean, who doesn't have that image in their mind of him putting the glove on? It's such a sham, too, because the glove was soaked in blood. So the the leather had no stretch left in it. Yeah. And his defense team told him to stop taking his arthritis medication so his knuckles would swell. Oh, goodness. That's so smart. He, he could, I mean, he, smart for them. There's a, a lot of things they did that was <clears throat> that was really underhanded. Now this, you know, historical perspective here. This is on the on the you know tail end of the riots in L.A. after after the Rodney King uh, incident. You know they, <clears throat> of course, that was misreported. They kept calling Rodney King a motorist. No, he was in a high speed chase. <laughs> and I'm saying they should have beat the snot out of him. No, but. Uh, Chris Rock once said, uh, uh, talk about how not to get your ass beat by the police. And what is, uh, don't run. If, if a cop has to chase you, an ass beating's coming with him. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, I was amazed at, and we got this, I, I was amazed at all the reactions to OJ passing away last Thursday. Uh, everybody seemed to have their own opinion of, of OJ. And look, OJ was one of the most loved people in the United States. Everybody loved OJ, not just football fans. Uh, Hertz commercials, the Naked Gun playing Nordberg. Oh yeah, the I remember Naked watching. Gun. I remember that. Oh. I remember watching the 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 chase. I, I was in the in the uh, field house at, at high school, and and we're like Nordberg is running for the police. <laughs> uh, he was, but he was he was. Beloved, but but once the cameras were watching, and, and look, I heard nothing but good things about the way he was in public. For uh, he shook everybody's hand, signed every autograph. He w- was was charming and personable. But once the door closed and lights were off, he was a horrible human being, and he abused Nicole Brown Simpson. He he absolutely did. He, he was an abusive husband. There's uh, there are nine one one tapes, and you know I put something on Facebook, and this this is a pattern that we see with abusers that is that. Outside looking in, you can't believe it. They're some of the most charming people in the world. I mean, how, how do you think they, they, they keep these, these, these victims? Is because when things are good, they're super charming. When things are bad, they're really bad. Yeah. And like so often happens with, with, uh, with domestic abuse, the, the victim dies. Yep, and that's what Gloria Allred said. Who I don't think we're fans of Gloria, but she was Nicole Brown Simpson's, uh, you know, she was with the family during this trial, but she said the same thing you just said, basically, is, uh, you know, she, you said exactly right, so. Yeah, and and look, I, I every once in a while, you're going to agree with people. Every once in a while, I agreed with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, too. Yeah, I mean, the clock's right twice a day, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and Jenner, kids, yeah, I was going to say, Caitlin yeah. tweeted good riddance, but there were rumors that OJ slept with uh, Miss Jenner back in the day. Uh, and then well, I didn't realize there was still money out there on the table. So, the, the, you know, the Goldman's attorney, David Cook, told TNZ that, you know, while he may be gone, his multi million dollar judgment is not. And the Goldman's are interested in discerning what money assets he may have left behind that they can collect. So, his legal problems are still not over. Well, there are things that OJ gave us. One are the Kardashians, because was it Robert Kardashian, Kim's father? Uh, 
actually got his law license reinstated in California so that he could talk to OJ and have, have privileged conversations. <laughs> uh, he, this trial really brought about the 24 hour news cycle. It did. Yeah. It was all over the news. Who was the, and, who was the it, police officer during this trial that kind of botched up some of the stuff? Do you remember him? Oh, I can't, I can't remember. I, I remember the, uh, Marsha Clark, judge Ito, uh, obviously somebody, Johnny Cochran. Yep. Yep. All those. The, the Kato, other dirty trick it was a like Cato. Cato Kalen. I saw Kato him on Kalen, TV last right, night. Right. Yep. Uh, the other thing that that they did is OJ. For OJ, never really considered himself a, a, a black celebrity. I mean, obviously he knew he was black, but you know he never really f- flew the flag of saying you know he's he's a pioneer for 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 black celebrities or anything like that. His house was decorated with with pictures of him and, and his friends, other celebrities, black, white, you know. Uh, you know, anybody else. And before they brought the jury in, because they brought the jury in to, to look at the layout of where they found the the, the evidence, where Cato Kalin's uh, uh, house actually was on the, on the property, the guest house. So brought, before they before they did that, they took all those pictures down and put it back up with with a more, uh, more African-American theme. Again, this is right after Rodney King. Mm-hmm. So so he they, they played it up. The, the lead chair, even though Johnny Cochran was, was a brilliant attorney, absolutely brilliant. I th- he didn't have a soul for, for defending OJ like that, but I, I guess you know every defendant is, in, is entitled to a vigorous defense. Oh, yeah. Uh, but th- there was there, Marsha Clark was just losing her mind over this because she, she knew what the hell they were doing. But they, they, she couldn't tell the jury. It would have it been a mistrial. And they could tell the jury that that he that he redecorated to to, to make him to make himself more more uh, sympathetic, especially after the riots and all that stuff. And look, the the response from not all the entire black community, but the response like Oprah had 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 it live and stuff like that. The response of yeah, so somebody like me finally uh, finally the justice system works for us. Like he murdered two people. My opinion. I'll get the disclosure later. My my opinion, but he's accused of murdering two people, yeah, right. innocent people, yeah, innocent, and and an abuser. And look, it's it's the mindset is if I can't have you, nobody can. Yep. And I don't even know if, if she and 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 Ron were were dating or, or they were just friends. I had no idea. Uh, Cato is actually her friend, and she she uh, allowed him to move in when she was still living on the property, and and Kaylin said he he rarely socialized with with uh with oj every once in a while he'd get an invite to a party or something like that he'd you know go across the compound and go hang out for a little while but you know he he and oj weren't you know quote unquote friends which is kind of appropriate Cato was a young kind of surfer guy and oj was was well into his 40s yep if not 50s well i guess it wouldn't be 50s he was died at 76 so inflation is still out of control yeah, this is wild. I think everybody probably, it, everybody down on the ground realizes inflation is out of control. You know, this has been after months of Biden touting that inflation was coming down. Uh, but uh, in March, U.S. consumer prices increased more than expected. You know, we've had, the Fed has been monitoring this. They raised interest rates. Now with this third straight month of consumer price readings, uh, while they were supposed to cut interest rates five times in 2024, there's talks now that they may actually raise interest rates again to try to get this under control. Uh, so the job market's hot, uh, inflation's hot, and again Biden tried to come out this week and say that it was inflation was going down. In his mind, yeah, inflation is not as high as it was two years ago, but inflation is still going up. I mean, prices are still climbing. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's climbing places where they don't even count inflation. Oh yeah, because they totally. don't they don't count food and with, with inflation, which, which is absurd to me because that's the one thing you really can't get away from. The, the stories are coming out, and I'm sure some of these are hyperbole, but people skipping meals in order, in order to, to, to afford life. And now that goes back to the eighties of, of old people eating dog food, which is not true and <laughs> never happened because because dog food's actually more expensive than going and getting a can yeah, of, uh, I of, think it is. Uh, of yeah yeah dog food's expensive. Yeah, it's it's expensive to have a pet. 
Uh, and that is another sad thing is, is people are people are getting rid of their pets. They're dropping the pets off at shelters. They, they can't afford it. You know, that's 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 sad. Because vet bills are, are going up. You know, dog food's going up just like other food. But, you know, I, th- I think we're, what we're going to see is we're going to see whole foods get hurt. Because people aren't going to go for the organic raw milk or whatever whatever you get there that's that's fifteen dollars a gallon when they when they can go to go to Kroger's and get get it for seven. Yeah, right, right. So you're gonna you now no one's going to admit it, you know, especially the the crowd that that does that that's a Whole Foods type crowd that you know that wants to be seen. It's the same stuff just yep. with a different label on it. But no, but this is very so, concerning. I mean, it's going to uh, it's going to impact the president. I mean, all this is in the leading up to a presidential election in November. But you know, Biden's been touting all this is going down, and it's clearly inflation is not going down. Well, and and, and we all feel it. Oh, hundred percent. Tax taxes are up. You know, the the Trump tax cuts uh, have expired, and today being tax day, I have to go write a substantial check <laughs> and, and yes i wait to, i wait till tax day to pay that so these yeah i filed mine last week but i told them don't pull the money out until the 15th <laughs> but you know interest interest rates are up inflation's up uh houses are are you know new houses are are, are moving i guess a little bit but you you just not yeah, but the challenge is nobody with a, like people like me that have a 2.7% interest rate I wouldn't mind moving and, and doing something differently, but so many people, I talked to a real estate agent this week, people just aren't moving with those low interest rates. And, you know, that's impacting the housing market. And then there's very little inventory as it is. It, it's just, it's, and I don't think we're in a housing bubble at all. I think it's totally different in 2007, but it's, uh, well, it's a, it's a different foundation. Different. Two, 2007 was built on Dodd-Frank, yeah, yeah. which was the idea that, that home ownership is a human right. And they were taking junk loans and packing, packaging them up as as securities. And if a if an, an investor, you know, usually a bank or investment group, was going to buy mortgages, they had to take so many subprime mortgages t- t- to go with it. Yeah. And that's really what would cause the infl- the, uh, the the bubble. On top of that, the lenders knew the appraisers, so the the dirty side of it was the the. Appraiser would go to the lender, and go, "How much do you need out of this house?" Oh yeah, it was totally all that stuff going on back in those days. Oh yeah, it's yeah. So that, so this is a different foundation. Yep, a lot different. Now, do I see a little softening? Yes. Do I see the the burst? Not unless we start seeing houses uh, uh, houses go back, and if, if people are still sitting on their on their two percent, I don't see these houses going back. We may I see don't some. Either, def- but, you know, I saw the stat this week, and I almost included a story as uh, credit card delinquency rates are at like a 10 year high right now. Uh, so delinquency rates are high. People aren't paying off their credit cards. That's kind of the first sign that stuff is starting to change a little bit when people stop paying their credit cards. Well, credit cards are first. You, you need to, you need to keep your car cause you have to keep going to work and you need to keep yeah, your house. You need a place to live car and food. Yep. So what, what do we see going back? Uh, we may see a softening in the recreational market, RVs, boats, uh, 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 airplanes, so we may start seeing a softening in in those prices, because again, you don't need your boat to go to work. I mean, unless you're in the Keys or something like that, uh, you don't need your boat to go to work. So when it comes down to it, and you're sitting sitting around the kitchen table deciding what gets paid, we have to have we have to feed the family, we have to keep a roof over our head, and we have to have a car to get to work. Yep. Trump's first criminal trial starts this week. Yes, this is the first yeah, criminal trial up in New York. This is, I mean, this is total BS, but this is the Manhattan District Attorney, Alvin Bragg, uh, was you know, was accusing his team of uh, falsifying business records uh, for concealing, uh, for in order to conceal, you know, breaches of state and federal law. So he's charged with 34 felony counts of falsifying business records. Naturally, Trump denies all the charges. This is the underlying events around this was the payments made to, I hate to call her porn actress, but this was the porn actress Stormy Daniels and former Playboy model Karen McDougal. So this was back in 2016, right? Uh, Trump's tried to postpone the trial further. They've run out of road on that, and it starts uh, 
on the day that this uh, podcast drops next week. Crazy stuff. And I, I mean, the, char- the good thing to note here is the charges are usually misdemeanors. But he actually made this a felony because he added some other like falsifying business records in. So it's just this total garbage, right? This was, if it is true, he made payments to a porn star, uh, a misdemeanor at most. But that, that district attorney up in New York has made it a felony to go after President Trump. Is it Avenatti that that was uh, Strawberry Daniels' attorney that's in prison? Yeah, I think that was true. Right? Yeah, yeah, he he came he came out. It's funny when when you're on the other side of the bars and said there's no way Trump can get a fair trial in New York. Yep, and this involves attorney Michael Cohen. So some supposedly Trump paid Michael Cohen for uh, legal services, and then Michael Cohen paid Stormy Daniels. So it was kind of like Michael Cohen sitting in the middle. Trump gave the money to Michael Cohen, and Michael Cohen gave it to Stormy Daniels. You know, I can't believe we're at the point where we got this being brought up, right? Alvin Bragg is probably the worst district attorney in the nation. You know, all the crime going on in New York City at the moment. And this is what he chooses to spend his time on. Uh, It's it's truly amazing. It's not shocking. It's not shocking, but it's amazing. All all these folks ran on, on getting Trump. Oh, yeah. That was their yeah campaign slogans. So, first of all, Stormy Daniels is an awful prostitute. <laughs> I don't like, know what a good one is. Well, no, I mean that's that's part of it. Is is you're paying for silence. I, I remember at, at one point she was trying to prove that uh, uh, that it did happen, even though Trump denies it, and she was uh, describing uh, you know his his little Donald. And uh, even and she was describing it, and, and everybody, even people who don't like Trump, like whoa, out of line. No, no, no. <laughs> but you get yet two two of these ladies, and and you've got Hunter Biden, who's doing coke with multiple prostitutes. Oh yeah, right. Are arguing about the 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 weight of the crack that he bought with with, with, with a hooker. Yeah, and I don't then, care if, I, if Trump slept with her or, or, or I them. I, I don't care. I don't care, care about I mean, stuff. It, I really don't. And then I don't I mean, know if you if, saw this week, but the lady that found that, you know, like uh, President Biden's diary down in Florida, I think it was in Florida, uh, you know, she was moving to the house, di- diaries there. She sold it to Project Veritas for twenty or $25,000. She's going to jail for, what, a month or so? So they, I mean, they literally... Sent some, I mean, this just shows how the justice system is in, in the U.S. right now, where they continue to go after people for these type of nonviolent crimes. Uh, and, and it's just being weaponized. Uh, it's weaponized in this case. It was weaponized against the girl that sold the diary. I, people are going to get tired of this at a certain point. And they're going to lose faith in a judicial system. Going to? I know. I mean, you try to, you try to, I mean, yeah, I mean they're going to right, especially at the federal level. Like I've got, I've got a lot of faith in my local uh, court system, but once you get up higher than that, yeah, you, you lose faith when people are doing this kind of stuff. We, we've got an activist DA in New York, one in Atlanta. We've got activists, uh, 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 U.S. attorneys. They're they're picking and choosing what they're going after, and like you said, Alvin Bragg has real crime to go after. Fannie Willis has a jail full of people with a backlog of cases. We've got people dying in the in the in the Fulton County Jail of of bug bites and and, and things like that when he was in jail pre trial longer than he would have served if, if he were found guilty. Yep. And they should have done what was a ten thirteen hold and got, gotten this dude some help. I mean, the dude definitely had had a screw loose. But we've got a huge backlog of cases, and where she's decided to spend energy, going after Trump. I know. And why That's did she, why did she wait till till twenty twenty four to go after him? Because she wanted it during an election year. Yeah, and I think and she wants it's gonna be hard for Trump she wants to get a spotlight. Off on this case. Yeah, it's gonna be hard for Trump to get off on this New York case. I don't know how any. I don't know how they can find jurors to uh, keep an open mind on this because everybody. I mean, every juror up there has been tainted at this point, and you're in New York, which is so. I, I don't know how he. It'll be interesting to see how he comes out of this case 
uh, and then if he has found guilty of this felony, what happens at that point? I mean, are they going to try to throw someone running for, they're going to throw a former president, somebody running in office again in jail? I, I, look, this is a trial that everybody says is the one that he could lose. He could be charged with a felony and serve jail time. I don't know how you do that. Yeah, but you know they will. I mean, what's there, what's to stop this guy? I, I don't know. I, I I don't I, I don't know the the technical aspect of, of how you imprison a, a former president who is due Secret Service protection. You know, throw throw a former president into into Sing Sing, and tell him good luck. I suggest you learn how to make a shank. Yep. Who knows? We'll see that. <laughs> So is Seattle still in the United States? No, this is a crazy story. Yes, this kind of, I mean, I think everybody knows how how liberal the town of Seattle is or the city of Seattle. But these women, this there was a women's country line dance. Uh, they were going to perform at a Seattle dance convention last week. And they were wearing American-themed, American flag-themed shirts. Uh, supposedly, some of the attendees felt triggered and unsafe because this country line dancing team had on shirts with American flags on them and they made them, they wanted them to take them off and the, the line dancer said, screw that. We're not doing it. You know, this, we don't take political stances. We just came to dance. This was part of our outfit. And if you want to take us off, we're leaving. And they did. So good for them. Well, a lot of them drove to the competition oh, yeah, in right. their costume. Yep. Now, if they, if they want to get into topless line dancing, well, I'll, I'll be in the front row. But they were offering to, to give them, like, T-shirts or something to, to compete in. They're like, no. I just didn't know the flag was a political statement any longer. I thought it was patriotism. I didn't think it said, hey, if you display a flag outside your house, for example, does that mean you're a Republican? And if you don't display a flag, you're – I mean, I just – I've never looked at the flag or people that is, is political in nature. I just thought it was our, our flag. Oh, yeah, I, I I don't understand the the triggered and unsafe. How how do you feel unsafe about about a bunch of girls who who dance and who line dance? Yeah, I'm also tired about people. Yeah, I'm tired with that statement that if something I don't like, if I see something I don't like or hear something I don't like, I suddenly feel unsafe and triggered. Like we've got people got some growing up to do. If just something they see makes them feel like an outfit makes them feel unsafe, like. What are these line dancers going to come out in the audience and like, get in a fight with you? What, what does that mean, unsafe? How does a shirt make somebody feel unsafe? Well, it goes to, there's a, a talk at one of the universities, maybe a Dartmouth, I can't remember which university it was, and it was uh, LGBTQ plus XYZ group saying, <clears throat> and this woman who who's admittedly a, a lesbian said that, Reminding reminding her that that supporting Hamas uh, is bad because the, of what they would do to her is in and of itself homophobic and violent. I know. What words are not violence? <laughs> like we, there are plenty of examples of what violence is. Words are not are not it. You know the Israelis weren't slaughtered by words from Hamas. Yep. So, I, yeah, that's more stupidity. I know, it's terrible. On the subject of stupidity, we have Texas Congress people. God, how many dumb congressmen do we have from Texas? This is either like they're really good or they're really bad. Uh, th- these comments came from Representative Jasmine Crockett, who is a congressman out of Texas. She said that black Americans, or she suggested that black Americans should be exempt from paying taxes as a form of reparations. But she admitted that the plan may not be a success as many within a community who are poor, quote, aren't really paying taxes in the first place. So this was during an interview with host Jay Carter, uh, or she came up with this harebrained idea. She goes, and this is a quote too, so, so many black folk, not only do you owe for the labor that was stolen and killed and all the other things, right, but the fact is we end up being so far behind, end quote, she said, And she said the plan may have a shaky foundation and some people within the community are not paying taxes in the first place. This was on the Black Lawyers podcast. It was. If if a white dude 
said, oh, it doesn't matter. They don't play. They don't pay taxes anyway. Yeah, I can't He'd be imagine. canceled. Yeah, he, yeah. He'd be canceled. I just, you're Wait. talking about sending our brightest and best to D.C.? Holy smokes. And we got another story about this in a few minutes. But how do you just openly have this type of racist talk and no one bats an eye? How is this not headline news that someone says this? I I don't know. And I don't I don't under I don't understand. Look, if you want to get rid of income taxes, period. I'm I trust me, I'm down. I I'll lead the charge with you. But it's but it's not about that. It's not about a, a rising tide lifts all boats. It's it's about this is what I want for us. About something that happened 200 years ago. Look. <laughs> It's it's a it's an ugly part of our history, but it's two hundred years in the past. We, you, you need to figure out what what you can do if you're really worried about the black community. What can you do to improve conditions of the black community? And it's not taking from other people. It's how to get people to rise above their economic situation. Yep. And we uh, have plenty of examples. Uh, Charles Payne, who's a, a, a Fox Business host, grew up poor, went to the Air Force. I believe he uses GI Bill to get educated, uh, and a very successful business owner and investor, and is now a host on, on Fox Business. But he he grew up poor, and he and they asked him what his you know what really motivated him. He goes, "Growing up poor is is, is a hell of a motivator." So it's, instead of the the soft racism of lowered expectations, how about raising expectations? How about raising? Raising poor people out of their situation. And look, I don't yeah, think it's a white black feel, thing. Yeah, it's not a victim either. Like this whole victim mentality. Right, we've got to move past that. Well, yeah, I can out victim you. Yes. But look, it's to me, it's not a white black thing. It's a socioeconomic thing because there are plenty of people in Appalachia. There are plenty of dirt poor white people that are are, are stuck in the cycle of of being being born to a family of ten. Of, of drug use and, and, and that kind of stuff. There's, there's plenty of that. And you have to be willing to, to bring yourself out of that situation. And if, if there's any doubt, there's a, there's a documentary called the wonderful whites of West Virginia. And it is scary. I mean, it's bad. I mean, it's, it's good information, but it's, it's hard to watch. Yep. And it's the, the reason it's the wonderful whites is the family's name is white. Yep. So yeah, that, that, this chick's an idiot. Oh, no. So Braz- Brazil is cracking down on free speech. Yeah. So this is all about this is all going to X, which is formerly Twitter. The new uh, there's a judge down there, Supreme Court Justice Alexandra de Moraes. I guess I say his name right, but he has uh, reached out to X and Elon Musk and tell them they need to block certain popular accounts in Brazil. Uh, from publishing, you know, from tweeting from Brazil. And they've actually threatened to arrest all the ex-employees down in Brazil. Hey, good for Elon. I mean, I love this guy. He stood up to him. He said, we're not doing anything. We're not suppressing anybody's free speech in Brazil. Uh, but this has turned into a pretty big deal where, and, and by the way, the other social media companies have all blocked. So, you know, they reached out to Facebook and Google and those guys and gave them blocking orders. And it sounds like all of them complied. But uh, Elon hasn't complied, and he's pushing back and really starting to uh, really share a lot more information about what's going on in Brazil on Twitter. Yeah, <clears throat> Elon's like, no. Yeah, we're not doing that. Yeah, good for him. Good for Elon. And look, he doesn't need the money for Brazil. If Brazil uh, blocks X, he'll be he'll be just fine. Yeah, I know. But uh, good for him because I, I mean, free speech. He's he's promised. And look, I like Twitter. I like I, I can't stand calling it X. I like to call it Twitter. Twitter's a lot better now. Uh, and what they did during the last presidential election, where the government was conspiring with the people at Twitter to to you know either not amplify certain people's voices or either just to completely block, to me was a, a clear violation of First Amendment. So I'm glad Elon is finally stepping up and and uh, going with this approach. Now it's driving hey, the left crazy. I mean, part of that is the left doesn't know what to do at this point. Yeah, you you can call Elon names on, on X, and now if he gets a hold of it, 
you probably don't want to get a back and forth with him because he's a pro uh, yes, <laughs> at, at tweeting. I mean, you probably, he's going to make you look like, an, look, look like an idiot, but he's not going to delete you, to block you, right. mute you, or, or anything else. You know, say what you want. Yep. And and for for that, I, I I applaud Musk. I mean, that's 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 he's he's standing by by his principles. I yep. still think his Cybertruck is ugly as homemade sin. Ah, yeah, it's terrible. So uh, Kemp suspends Georgia mayor for theft. <laughs> Goodness, yeah, mayor of Pineview in Wilcox County. I don't know exactly where Wilcox County is, but the mayor down there is called Brandon Holt. He was arrested back in January after a GBI investigation accused him of stealing nearly sixty-five thousand dollars from the city. This city only has five hundred residents. Uh, so Governor Kemp this week just suspended him from, or last week suspended him from being mayor of that uh, town. What's funny about this is this is not even the first time this guy was in trouble. So a couple of years ago, he was indicted in Bibb County, which is Macon, of fraudulently using an account number of a Macon construction company owner uh to move money around so i don't know uh, how in the world did people in this tiny town elect this guy after he'd already been accused of stealing money that's what's amazing unfortunately it's not shocking it's not shocking because if you but it goes to show that these small towns and you know you've got to have double checks on you can't just let one person like this be able to steal money there should be double and triple checks on anybody that's got access to the purse strings now this guy made 75 transactions through the mobile app payment app cash app so he's actually cash apping money from the pine views general account into his own personal bank account so he actually get the i mean he hooked up cash app on the city's accounts and sent himself money to his personal bank accounts I, how does this idiot think he's going to get, get, get away with that? I mean, yeah. the transactions are right there. And look, if the city is small enough where they don't have enough people to monitor like the account and what's going on in the account, they don't need to be a city. They need to just, yeah, d- they need to be, you know, the city needs to be done away with. Yeah, dissolve the city. Uh, you get 500 residents, hand it over to the county. Yes, yeah, totally I, right. I, don't, <clears throat> I mean, I don't even know what kind of. What kind of police? What what services do they provide? They have to provide, yeah, to provide something. At least two services. Uh, yeah, most little cities like this, because we've got five cities in the county I live in. Four of them are very small, but uh, yeah, they have to provide like water and sewage, and that's what most of them provide. And then uh, there's something else I forget, and that may be it. It may be water and sewage. That may be classified as two that they have to provide. But most little cities don't need to be cities. They could just uh, be unincorporated or be part of the county. Yeah, and, and there's nothing wrong with being part of the county. It, it certainly reduces your tax burden. Yes, right. I mean, I, I don't know. This this is a, this is a very good study on on why we should get rid of a lot, a lot of these cities. Look, yes. if you have a city that's do, that that is has a police force, fire department, you know, obviously they have enough residents to to support that. But some of these cities, when they say a police department, they have an officer who works eight hours a day, isn't there on the weekends, and the sheriff's department's covering it anyway. Yep. So that's... But yeah, looks like old dude's going, uh, is going to go uh, go away on that one. Because, look, you, you can't you can't refute it. Yep. It, you, he's going to go to trial, and they're, they're going to pull out, they're going to pull out the, uh, the records and show it to the jury and go, went from here to here. And it's the same transaction numbers. Mm-hmm. No, no. I mean, it's just not that hard to prove. Nope, not at all. This is a good time to remind you these are our opinions, not those of anyone not on the show or any respective company for which we may work, own, or otherwise associate ourselves with on a regular or irregular basis. Also, you can find other episodes and relevant stories over the georgiavirtue.com. Kenny, you got the mule. Good Lord, I hate to pick on more Texas uh, congressmen, but this is Sheila Jackson Lee, and this happened during the eclipse last week. As, and again, she's been serving in Congress since 1995. So almost 30 years she's been serving in Congress, which is, I'm a huge uh, proponent of not serving that long. I'm not going to say term limits, but 30 years in Congress is way too much. But she was actually speaking to attendees at a high school last Monday when a solar eclipse came by. And she went off on this <laughs> speech where she claimed that the 
by claiming that the rock solid moon is a planet that is mostly made up of gases. And then she added she wants to be the first in line to learn how to live there. <laughs> now, I don't know, Sheila Jackson Lee is 74 years old. She said the moon was made of gases and she wants to be, learn how to live on the moon. Uh, she gave, I mean, first of all, I don't know if you saw the video, but she couldn't figure out how to put her glasses on to look at the eclipse. It took her like five minutes to figure out how to put them on. Uh, and then she just went off on this half brain deal of trying to describe the moon and the sun. Later, she said she confused the moon with the sun, which led everybody to say, well, what does she think? She can live on the sun now? <laughs> but, but good Lord, this lady. I mean, she had no I wouldn't help her try. Yeah, everybody needs to watch the video of Sheila Jackson Lee last week if you hadn't seen it already. And just watch What's her it? describe the sun and the moon and how all the gases and how everything fits together. Was it Hank Johnson yeah, that was, was worried that yeah, Guam was yeah going that we were her. we were going to capsize Guam by putting uh, too much weight on on the island? Yep. Yeah, she said. The, I mean, she and she quoted here. She said, "Obviously, I misspoke and meant to say the sun, but as usual, Republicans are focus, focused on stupid things instead of stuff that really matters." Yeah, the stupid thing being her. Uh, what can I say? Foolish thinkers lust for stupidity, she said of GOPers who criticized her gaffe. Which makes less sense, right? She said now she wants to live on the sun. <laughs> it's like her excuse got even crazier. Oh, goodness. She's an idiot. Yeah, she is I a mean, big time idiot. She's got the highest turnover in Congress, too, and her staff. That works for her. So not only is she an idiot to say stuff like this, she obviously treats her staff really bad because of the turnover in her office. Um, yeah, not a good look for her last week. And look, being a congressional staffer, if you're into politics, is is a is a big step, and to and to walk away from it because she's such an ins- insufferable bee. <clears throat> it and. I don't. I, I have. I have not heard good things about, about about the way she treats her staff. I mean, mood swings and yelling and stuff right, like that. Exactly. But yeah, watching her fumble with the, with those cardboard glasses, and she's she was talking to kids, and, and she was speaking as an authority to kids. And even the kids are looking at her like, <laughs> "What?" Yeah, they were looking at her like, "What is this lady saying?" Yes, what a mess. Okay. Go go find the class idiot and uh, and elect him. <laughs> Very true. All right, so state prosecutor uh, to investigate Lieutenant Governor Burt Jones. Yeah, so this started, if you remember, when Burt Jones was a state senator during the last election. He's now Lieutenant Governor. He was one of the 16 GOP officials who cast electoral votes, electoral college votes back in December of 2020. Uh, Fonnie Willis, if you remember, she was going to, prosecutor she wanted to move forward prosecute lieutenant governor jones a judge stepped in and said there was a conflict of interest there because who was it dave Fonny had contributed to the person that burt jones ran against for lieutenant governor so the, the, the judge said obviously there's a conflict of interest here so for the last 21 months well, I think she had, a, had held a fundraiser yeah, for it wasn't just yeah, it, was, it wasn't fundraiser. like uh, so it wasn't uh, judge mcafee check. right yep so about 21 months ago, Pete Skandalakis, who is over the prosecuting uh, attorney's council of Georgia, was tasked with trying to find somebody around the state to prosecute Burt Jones, lieutenant governor. So for the last 21, 21 months, he's been overseeing an investigation uh, to try to or overseeing a process to try to get someone to prosecute him. He could, And that would be like going down to where I live in Pike County and trying to find a Superior Court judge to prosecute the lieutenant governor. Like nobody's taking, nobody is stepping out and saying, "Yeah, I'll take." You know, I, I want some of that. Uh, so for twenty one months, he couldn't find anybody. Last week, last Thursday, he actually announced that he will lead the investigation into Lieutenant Governor Burt Jones's alleged role in trying to help former President Donald Trump overturn a twenty twenty election in Georgia. So this is kind of a big update to the story that now Pete Scandalakis is going to be leading the investigation. Interesting. It is. Yeah, very you, interesting. You're, you're appointed to be to be a, a search committee, essentially. Yeah, that's what it was. A recruiter to, to find somebody and then go, you know what? I'll just do it myself. I will hire myself. 
Nearly couldn't find anybody. I mean, nobody wanted to. T- who would take this case? And if if anybody did take this case, it would have had to been uh, maybe it's some somebody out of Athens or one of the more you know liberal uh, cities in Georgia. And if that would have been the case, that obviously would have looked like they were prosecuting him just to, you know as a political vendetta. Uh, so now he's doing it. Why yeah. not hand the stuff off to Chris Carr? Well, Chris is not going to prosecute anything. Well, I know. <laughs> but I, what I don't understand is why these counties are taking it upon themselves to, to get into involve, involved in something that is obviously a state issue, and Chris Carr should be handling it. Well, you know, the reason that Fonnie Willis was originally in it is because she said this activity happened at the Capitol, Georgia State Capitol, which is in her county. So that's why she took this case originally. She said this is a county issue because it happened in Fulton County. Uh, I would argue that it's not in Fulton County, that it is actually state, much like you would consider an embassy as uh, the belongs to that nation that, that has the embassy, not, not part of that country. Yeah, so I mean, that's the an fact that the state, look at it. the state capital is not uh, guarded or run by city of Atlanta. It is, it is governed and run completely by the state. It's, it's a capital police, state troopers that, that take, take care of the capital, take care of the, the governor's mansion. Uh, and obviously the executive buildings where, where, uh, where Chris Carr works and, and, and Gary Black, and all, that's, that's, all, that's all state. <clears throat> that's all state property. So the argument that I would make is that she has no standing because it's not a county issue. It would f- be it would fall upon Chris Carr's office and prosecute on a state level. And if Chris Carr wants to uh, appoint a special prosecutor, that would be on him, not on an individual county. Because the crime is not against the people of Fulton County. The alleged crime would be against the people of the state of Georgia. Yeah, man, I, I hear you. <laughs> I do. Not sure I disagree either. Now, I'm sure some legal beagle will say, well, she's technically a state employee, and and, and she is. The The prosecutors work for, may work, work for the county, but the, the DA is, is, a, is, a state, is a state officer. I don't know. It's... it's, it's, it's to me, it's just it, she does she doesn't have standing, and I think that would be an interesting argument to see the Trump team make. Yep, it's the same thing I would say about the civil case Trump in New York, that that three hundred million or whatever it is, the, the, the civil court state, the state of New York doesn't have any standing because they didn't lose anything. All right, that'd be like me suing, I don't know, local car dealer. For, for something they did to somebody else and me suing personally. No, I don't have any standing. I didn't lose anything. No, that's true. If that person wants to sue, that's on them. So, <clears throat> it's, it's so convoluted. And honestly, even if, even if Trump is convicted in, in New York, going back to the Alvin Bragg story, it'll be, it'll be tied up in the legal system for years with, with appeals and all that stuff before they actually throw him in the clink. I mean, he, yeah, he could be elected. To, yeah, but uh, hold on. If he's found guilty and he's sentenced, you don't get to just stay out until all your appeals get taken care of. I mean, he could literally be reprimanded to prison that day. He could. I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah, but you're dealing with New York. I mean, I didn't. I didn't think any of this stuff was going to happen, right? I didn't. Yeah. I didn't think people that went to D.C. on January 6th were going to get thrown in jail for years and years and years either. But that's you know, we're people are political prisoners at this point, and that's what it sounds like Trump could be. I think. I think New York totally throws Trump in jail if he's found guilty, like instantly. <laughs> I mean, I hope not, but because I think there would be a total. Can you imagine people in, in the United States if they threw a, someone running for president into jail? Uh, what's going to be the reaction from, from most people at that point? I mean, is that really the point where people really go crazy and start mass protest across the country? Or do they just sit back and keep paying $4 and, and, for a dozen eggs and you know, $4 for a gallon of gas? I don't know. I don't know. Bread and circus, my friend. Yep. Bread and circus. So, why in the hell are we funding NPR? I have no clue. 
Uh, yeah, this story came out last week, uh, and it really came out of uh, someone that had worked at NPR for a while. They did an investigation at NPR, and they found 87 registered Democrats working in editorial positions at NPR and zero Republicans. You know, if you listen to NPR over the years, and I have turned it on quite often, you can tell there's a huge liberal Democrat slant and what NPR uh, puts on the air. And our government funds a lot of that money. So the question is, why are, why are we funding, why are me and you, Dave, funding a radio station? And why is it the government's responsibility also? At the end of the day, we are talking about this earlier with a hotel that's being built by a local city. But why is it the government's responsibility to, to fund a radio station at this point? Uh, that, that's the probably the biggest question out there. And, you know, if Republicans ever want to do something, this is what I don't understand about Republicans in Congress. Why do they just not defund it? Make a big deal out of this, defund it, and let's move on. This is like defunding yeah. Planned Parenthood for all those years. Like Republicans would constantly go, we got to defund Planned Parenthood. Guess what? It never happened. So I, and there's a there's a reason that well, first of all NPR is the, even even if it were fifty fifty is yeah, so passe yeah they're hundred percent right. conservative it's, it's, I don't want us funding it <laughs> yeah as we sit here on a podcast you know you have liberal podcasts you have you know anti you know conservative uh, uh, conservative podcasts you've got people like us that that are you know, more libertarian leaning, you know, spending conscious podcast. You have, you have pretty much anything that you want that is a minimal cost to, to put out. NPR, if, if, if people like it that much, stand on your own. Exactly. Yeah. Let them fund it. And, uh, if you're an NPR, NPR listener, Hey, put your checkbook where your mouth is. And fund them. But my money should be taken from me to fund NPR, which is something I hardly ever listen to. And if I do listen to it, it goes against my ideology. Now, why is my tax dollars going for NPR? I have no idea. I, 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 don't, I don't understand why it's a thing. Yeah. First of all, the, the content, besides, besides being liberal, the content's crap. Yeah, it is terrible. The... The best uh, Saturday Night Live skit for Christmas was the NPR skit with Alec Baldwin. Yeah, because the 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 three of them, the the two ladies and Alec, the way they were they were talking sounds exactly like NPR. Yep, it, it's perfect thing to put on if you want to take a nap. <laughs> you know where you have yeah you, know, you have the Rush Limbaugh show which you. you whether you like him or hate him, you couldn't take a nap to it. Right. <laughs> you know, it's, and he had to sell advertising and yep. it made him quite wealthy selling advertising because people liked his content. People didn't always agree with him, but pe even people who didn't agree with him would tune in to, to, to hear what his side was saying. Yep. And it, if, if they can't, if their personalities can't bring listeners in, and then turn around and turn that into advertising dollars. It's not viable. Get rid of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's I and I know the argument. Such a small part of our budget. So, I mean, there are like five people that listen to the gardening show that comes on NPR on Saturday mornings, or whatever it is. Yep. Like, no, no, nobody's listening to it. And, hell, I don't even listen to terrestrial radio other than sports talk every once in a while. You know, I've, I've got satellite in my truck because I want to listen to music. I know. And I've got plenty of news stations that I can I can I can tune into with uh, with the satellite. People are listening to more and more stuff on their phones. Terrestrial radio, in and of itself, is is in trouble, I believe, because the format's just is just outdated. Mm -hmm. All right, Kenny. As we're winding down, what do you have for closing thoughts? Oh, I don't think I have much today. Uh, I can't wait to see. I know this is dropping on Monday, but I can't wait to see who wins the Masters this weekend. And, uh, yeah, that's going to be fun to watch. Well, Rosie the Riveter uh, was honored with a Congressional Gold Medal uh, for World War II work. That's the highest civilian award you can get. And it was 
when I say Rosie, it's it's several of the of the ladies that that were riveters that that walked their husbands or their fathers brothers went off to war, and they they took over building airplanes and ships and, and everything else. So many of them were were awarded posthumously because you know they're they're all in their nineties now. But I thought it was it was a cool ceremony. It, the speaker of the house was there. Several of the of the ladies who were who were riveters and and went to work in factories and and uh, uh, and all that. And they were as essential to winning World War II as the troops on the ground. Yep. Because without those airplanes, ships, firearms, ammo, you know, we'd just be we been just standing around in, in London waiting to get bombed. No, no. We had to have those those materials, and our labor force was women. And, and even though a lot of them were expected to give up their jobs when the, when the war ended and have the men come back in, it really opened the door to women in the workforce and realized that women could do more than sit at home, make babies, and dinner. Mm-hmm. And and what women decided is they didn't want to go back to the kitchen. They liked being <laughs> right, right. they liked being being part of the workforce. They liked earning. The the unfortunate thing of it is now that you families can't live on a single income anymore because th- that that part went into inflation too. Yep. Hell, a lot of families can't live on a double income right yeah, now. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's tough. So, on that happy note, but yeah, awesome, awesome thing. I'm, I I hate that it took so you know it took what ninety years to to recognize the, the these women who I mean these some of these women were. 16, 17 years old, going to work in factories, things that we would never let a 60-year-old go, go do now. You know, go run a welder. Mm-hmm. Now you can't get a 20-year-old to run a welder. <clears throat> so big thanks to Eric Cumby, who uh, hopefully can edit some of, some of my uh, sneezes out. <laughs> so, sorry about that. I, I, I feel fine. It just uh, kind of gave me a head cold. To Ken Pullen, my part of this endeavor, I'm Dave Roberts. We'll talk to you next week. Try to catch me howling at the moon.